This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Craft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. You're listening to episode 142. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcaps on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. First up, quick housekeeping here. Our next virtual event will be the SNN Network Australia virtual event taking place November 9th and 10th, 2020. It's actually 9th and 10th U.S. Pacific time, and then it's 10th and 11th Australian East Coast time. It took me a long time to figure that out, so I uh, just wanted to <laughs> make sure that uh, I had that right here. So uh, be sure to join us for this event. Uh, we just announced our speakers and initial sponsors, which are now live on the website. So make sure to register to participate in the entire show. Uh, the event, as I said, November 9th and 10th, 2020, U.S. Pacific time and 10th and 11th Australian East Coast time. For more information, please visit australia.snn.network and click register now. Look forward to seeing you there. The SNN Podcast Network is in full force this week, starting off with a really cool new series on avoiding the crowd with Maj Don. The series is called Portfolio Protection Series. And the goal of this series is to provide the bull and bear case on stocks that Maj and his panel of analysts feel deserve a deeper dive. The first company discussed is Purple Innovation Inc., PRPL on NASDAQ. I highly recommend listening to this episode. It's really cool great guests, great panel, the whole deal. So check out this episode on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or Podbean at avoidingthecrowd.podbean.com. The next episode of In the Market Trenches with Gary Reby and Eric Fure covers another incredible war story. But I wanted to take a moment that I, I wanted to make a special offer to everybody listening here right now. So if you wanted to share a war story. You got you got a war story. You, you want to get something on, off your chest, you know, or you want to just share either a winner or a loser and and really share those lessons with everybody on the SNN podcast network uh, as well as with our get our, our hosts um, shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com or shoot me a direct message on Twitter at Bobby K Craft, B-O-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. We really love to hear all of your stories out there and, and share them with our, with our, our audience. So um, yeah, be sure to hit me up. If you want to come on, you know, we again, would love to have you. Uh, you can hear this episode, the latest episode of In the Market Trenches with Gary Reby and Eric Fury on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or Podbean at inthemarkettrenches.podbean.com. And the Investors Roundtable is back this week. Tune in every Friday morning to watch the latest episode of the Investors Roundtable. Every week, you never know who might be joining on our panel or what topic will be discussed. So tune in this Friday to find out. Subscribe to the SNN Network YouTube channel to be notified. That's youtube.com slash SNN Wire. Now, for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Bill Brewster. He is the founder and portfolio manager at Sulamar Capital Group. Uh, Bill is also a co-host on the very popular podcast series, uh, Value After Hours podcast with Tobias Carlisle and Jake Taylor. Uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing both Toby and Jake, and it was about time to bring on the third leg of the triumvirate, the most important leg, of course. Uh, Bill is already a legend, and rather than do my typical style of interview, you know, chatting about background, investing philosophy, and whatnot, um, I figured since you can hear that on a weekly basis on Bill's show, I thought it'd be fun to, you know, as, as the title states, let's just shoot the shit. Uh, we go everywhere from his thesis on his investment in Curate Retail Group to Cobra Kai, 
and I promise we, we do not get into any spoilers. So grab a beer and join us at the bar. This is Planet Microcap After Hours. Thank you again for tuning into episode 142 of the Planet Microcap podcast. And please enjoy my interview with Bill Brewster. Welcome back, everybody, to the Planet Microcap podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and joining me today is the third leg of the triumvirate, but that is in no particular order, okay? This just happens to be the third. Finally, I'm speaking with the third leg of the triumvirate. The most important uh, leg. The most important leg. Without um, me, the the, uh, the stool can't stand. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And uh, you can probably recognize by his voice, it is Bill Brewster. He is the founder and portfolio manager at Sulamar Capital Group. Bill, how are you doing this morning, man? Everything good? I'm doing okay, man. How are you? You know, just another, you know, just a, a beautiful day in uh, in virtual LA. You know, there you what, go. What can we have to complain about here? You know, it's just a another wild week in the markets, or we think, or who knows what to expect this week. That's how I kind of go into every week. I honestly don't have any idea what's going on, uh, <laughs> which is kind of nice. You know, I'm one of those that, and people would probably be surprised to hear this, even though we run a financial news website and everything. I do not look at the Dow or the S&P on a daily basis. I prefer not to. I usually get told, like, hey, you see what's going on? Like, oh, I didn't, didn't even see it. I, uh, I, I used to look a lot more often, and then I know we'll talk about it, but I, I sort of, I own and came out with this thesis on this Curate Retail Group, and it's sort of a big enough position for me, and um, like not, uh, it's just not very loved and whatnot. <laughs> and I, I have found that uh, avoiding stock prices, I, I've found myself on the golf course more often than I have been in the past. Nice. Um, I'm just n- not trying to not work. That's not an accurate description, but uh, trying to avoid distraction with stock prices uh, has been, I think, beneficial, but we'll see in a, in a while. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, hey, by the way, for those who don't know you, where, where are you based? Uh, well, right now I'm in Florida. I guess okay. technically uh, my home is still in Chicago, but I think that we've uh, we've pretty much settled on relocating. So we'll see how that all goes. I mean, I'm not sure if you're trying to stay anonymous or anything, but we're in Florida. Uh, I'm on the East Coast. I'm not trying to totally disclose okay. where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So there's good golf course. I guess there's, I mean. I'm somewhere north of Fort Lauderdale and not to Jacksonville. That would have been really funny if you were like, I'm somewhere north of Fort Lauderdale and south of New York. That's right. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Well, look, I appreciate you joining me. And before we even dig a little deeper, I wanted to really, firstly, I, I want to go here first because I just wanted to express my condolences for your cousin and just all the work that you did, man. Like that, that was really important at a really critical time, you know, when the markets are just going nuts and all these new traders are going out there on Robinhood. So just wanted to express my appreciation of you and, and all the, just all the awareness and everything you were doing on that front, man. Thanks, man. It was, um, <clears throat> it was actually my cousin-in-law. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's tough. I mean, um, for those that don't know, my cousin-in-law committed suicide. Uh, he opened up his Robinhood app and saw a negative balance that was like negative $730,000. And I don't believe that it was a real obligation. It's sort of a, a function of how option settlement is shown at near expiry. Um, so yeah, it was uh, that was a hell of a week. I hope I never have to have another one like it. I hope, I hope so for your sake and for everyone's sake, you know, and you know, the, thankfully you're carrying on his name and, and really making sure that there's a lot more awareness out there and people know what's going on. We're going to get into it a little bit later when I ask, yeah, you, know, no for, you know, about, you know, uh, things and advice for new investors that are going out there, especially in times like these and just the volatility and the, the craziness that is this, this market nowadays. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that a little later. I just I mean, wanted dude, to express the that, that at the beginning. Yeah, no worries. I mean, we might as well talk about some of it now. The thing that's, yeah, that's just kind of nuts is, you know, my perception of the incentives in that particular entity and really how a lot of them are getting skewed with free trading is, you know, there's a, there is objectively, I mean, just open up and see how they're compensated. And I think that it doesn't take a whole lot of thought to realize that like the heavy incentive there is to drive people away from low cost products and to higher cost 
products such as options and margin. And like that is, you know, I don't know, man, I see, I see user growth, like they're putting up, uh, I mean, Robinhood specifically is putting up, but uh, traders in general seem to be entering the market. I just get nervous when, uh, when I start to see the, the incentive structure pushing people to further, uh, r- like further out on the risk spectrum combined with less uh, market savvy usually doesn't end well, even if it goes okay in the, in the sort of middle innings. Well, you can tell in, you know, that this is really a potential problem when you see, you know, uh, I don't know if you follow at TikTok investors on Twitter and, and see some of what these TikTokers are doing out there, you know, and, and, you know, just look, I I happen to be a fan of the, of, of that profile because it's, you know, it's a, it's a parody, you know, they're kind of, you know, uh, kind of giving, giving a little, you know, giving a little shit to some of these guys that are putting out just ridiculous videos, you know, as new traders. And I'm not even going to say some of the names that they're talking about that are, you know, to the moon or this and that, you know, but at the same time, it caused a lot of worry, right? I mean, look, I've been in the game for about 10 years. I still don't really know what options are. I've done a couple interviews with guys who are doing options. I don't know shit. It's so yeah. confusing, you know, so to see people that are just getting started and now are options experts, it just blows my mind. Yeah, I think it's tough. I mean, uh, something <clears throat> for, I guess, you know, just a little bit of background on me. I don't, I don't run outside capital. It's just my own money. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the benefits that I've gotten from that is I think that uh, people realize that I'm not really pushing an agenda when I'm talking now, I mean, you know, there's eventually I may open up something to get some revenue coming in the door, but, uh, for (laughs) now, uh, I'm not. And, uh, it's, it's sort of opened, um, some conversations with some people that I don't know that I otherwise would have had. Right. And like, these are Mm -hmm. guys that I really respect and have been around the game for a long time. And, uh, you know, it's one in particular just said that, this market really the behavior in this market really reminded him of 87. And he was saying that that's not to say like, this is going to crash and it's not like none of that, but the amount of option usage and marketing right now, he just said like really, really reminds him of 87. And he's a guy that I think has a lot of, he's, he doesn't say it lightly. I don't know, you know, what conclusion to draw from that, but it's an interesting tidbit. Yeah. I mean, for you, you know, just kind of cutting right to the chase of, you know, since March to now, I mean, look, people can hear this on a weekly basis on the Value After Hours podcast, but I figured kind of getting an all-encompassing answer here. I mean, what's been, what's been the vibe from your perspective? What's been your take? Like, what, what is it that investors who are listening to this, you know, one, should, should, how should they think about the markets according to Bill Brewster right now? No, I don't know, man. I I just, I mean, like, look, I try to buy companies that I think I understand at reasonable prices. I mean, that's, that's all I do. That's all I'll ever do. Um, I don't, I have no idea whether or not some of these valuations are rational. I have no idea if they're not. Um, I think that it's hard for me to believe that some names that were trading what I would say is certainly not inexpensively before have tripled and quadrupled. And, you know, I I mean, it's interesting to me that on one hand, you'll have people argue, well, rates are low. So, you know, the, the discounted cash flow should not be like your front years don't matter as much. And then they'll also cite like this, acceleration of users as a reason to justify a stock price that's gone up. I mean, it, it's unclear. Maybe the TAM really has just expanded like crazy. And maybe these guys really are capturing all this market share. There's another side of the coin here where like the TAM has just been sort of brought in a little bit on the adoption cycle. And maybe the actual size hasn't changed all that much, but people's perception of it has and valuations have exploded and, you know, growth sort of disappoints. But I, I don't mean, I have no idea. Uh, I just sort of know that I don't know. Um, you know, I, I guess if I were to critique myself in March, I, I had a couple names like Eldorado Resorts. I held really, I mean, it was like eight bucks a share when I bought that thing. And uh, Restoration Hardware is one that I followed for a long time and I had the guts to buy it. And then um, 
you know, I sold it on liquidity concerns and I guess that I probably should have put more faith or for lack of a better term and like what the government was doing. Um, <clears throat> it certainly would have been more lucrative in the short term. The other side of that coin is I bought some pretty good businesses at some pretty good prices and I really didn't want to sell out of them to get into a less good business to make a quick sort of, you know, not quite puff. That's not the right, but I didn't want to turn an investment decision into a trading decision. Right. But I mean, I probably should have. Yeah. I mean, uh, would you expect, would, would you say that your investing style and your thesis and philosophy, uh, that, did that change at all from that, that March low, I guess we'd call it from our V shape, whatever recovery that we're in right now. I mean, has, has yeah. it changed or did you really stick to your print? Like, Oh, here's that bear market. They're all talking about, you know, I'm going to stick to my principles and, and <laughs> just I mean, find those companies yeah. that dropped and, and get in there. I don't know that I believe in <laughs> principles to be honest. Um, and that's probably going to offend some. Um, but I, I mean, I said it on value after hours when we were going through it, I said like, I don't think, so I was really long the airlines going into March, right? Like mm -hmm. my entire philosophy and who I'm trying to adopt my approach after is like Buffett and Munger and the whole right. own a business. Right. But by March 12th, I mean, I had to have a conversation with myself and it's like, okay, you're either going to be rigid to a textbook and get your ass kicked in this market, or <laughs> you're actually going to open up your mind and realize that like what is theoretically perfect is not always the best thing to implement. And, you know, I think, uh, if I can compliment myself, something that I do think that I, I do pretty well is understand like what my shortcomings are and where I think the market might be right. And also like, I, I don't hold any, the church I pray to financially is Buffett and Munger, but I don't think that other churches are like wrong per se. Mm -hmm. They may not be what I'm comfortable implementing, you know, at all times, but I, I would have had to be, in my opinion, given the conversations that I was having with other airline investors, right? I was asking liquidity prob uh, questions. They were answering with balance sheet answers. I knew I was early identifying the issue. So like, right. what are you going to do? You're going to get your ass kicked because you want to be theoretically right to, to some like, you know, per perfect idea. Um, so I think I'm reasonably good at identifying things like that. You know, I, in, in uh, December of 2018, um, you know, I bought, a couple names that maybe I wasn't quite there. For instance, like Netflix is one that I've never fully been there on valuation. But if you just looked how it traded in December, 2018, like it, it just didn't make sense. And I, I was like, all right, I'm buying this thing. Um, even if I can't actually put like my version of, you know, a, a valuation on it at that time, or if the valuation seemed rich to me, I have followed that stock and that story long enough to know that how it was trading was disconnected from reality. So I, I mean, I'm willing to enter a little bit of a trader's mindset at times. You know, funny, quick story on Netflix. I'm in the middle of moving right now and I don't know why, but I found a, like a piece of mail from 2010 that was like a free trial for Netflix kind of thing. I think they were yeah. still at the time doing the DVD. Um, yeah, the I, I was, time. I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've I've been a Netflix user forever. Don't own the stock, but Netflix. Yeah, user I mean, forever. I don't own it anymore. I so yeah. No, I don't fully buy what the market's selling from a long term <laughs> perspective on that company. But I also think it's it's very possible that that the market's correct on it. I just don't have a strong enough view to own it now. For sure. All right. Well, here's here. I'm gonna we're gonna go on the humor route. I mean, you know, we've talked about some some heavy things that have gone on between March and today. You know, some just from a business perspective, investing perspective. What's some of the quirkiest, funny things that you've seen and observed between that March time period and now on an investing side I mean, of things? If we could, dude, bring some I, I bought QVC. Like that's crazy. You did buy size. Right. Yeah. So like the idea that, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, part of the reason that my write up on that is so long is like how I communicate. I, I mean, I, I sort of have the blog for if I have something that I want to say, 
I try to say it there. Like if it's actually like thoughtful Twitter, I usually use as like sort of a, it's not, it's like a mental depository, right? It's almost like quick notes. Um, but you know, I mean here I, I was looking at what I perceived to be a pretty cheap common equity and, um, you know, something that I'll finish this story, but what we should come back to is what I found out about like structural reasons that people didn't buy it, how it pertains to micro caps. Um, so anyway, I started to like dig in and I, I had just written in March like this, or, or maybe it was even in January, like almost like this come to Jesus, like I'm going to focus on these quality businesses that are growers. And a lot of my portfolio is, but um, you know, here I'm, I'm like telling my family, right that I'm going to buy QVC on their behalf. Like that's insanity. Um, so <laughs> Wait, what did they say to that? that that's, that's too good. I want to hear their reaction. Well, I mean, look, I, that's why I kept writing. Like I kept, my write up is trying to kill the idea, right? Like right. everything right, I, right. I tried to kill it over and over and over again. And every time I did, I came back to the fact that like, I actually think this is a pretty good idea for this reason or this reason. And I mean, once, you know, like my wife is really my biggest client. Uh, she's the one that's going to have to change her house if things go horribly wrong. Um, and, you know, I mean, she read it and I, I mean, it got to a point like people ask like, Oh, how do you size bets? Whatever. I mean, I, I looked at her in the face and I said, how much can I lose on this idea before you resent me for the rest of our lives? And, and like, I wasn't trying to be funny with her, right? It's just like, I'm not trying to make a bet that's going to sacrifice our happiness together. But like, I think that this is a bet worth swinging at. So that's how I sized it. I didn't pay attention to percentage. So is currently QVC and HLN the number one channel on in your household right now? HSN? Going to- uh, no, the but... HSN's on. No, no. Actually, dude, probably I'm deep in Cobra Kai right now on Netflix. <sighs> That is a great decision. I know. Fantastic I know. decision. I'm I, not I, sleeping as well as I should, though. I destroyed it in a, maybe a day and a half. It's just such a great, easy watch. It's yeah, so it's much pretty fun. pretty freaking good. What, are you on season two already? Yeah, I just got there. It's getting... Well, I just got there. I got there last night. Now I'm on season or episode six. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I have a lot of conflicting thoughts. I like love Johnny. I hate Daniel. I don't know what's going on. It's like messing up my whole childhood. It, well, you know, they do. I think they do a pretty good job. Of, like you hate Daniel at first and then they kind of bring you back in. You're like, don't oh, ruin this for me. Do not ruin this. No, no. This is actually season one for me. That was okay, a season right, one take. Okay. That was a season one take where it's like. Good. Cause I'll oh, end this right now. If you mess it up. <laughs> Don't, dude. Oh it's, oh, it's so good. Season three could not come here soon enough. But yeah, that's what I hear. When's it dropping? Twenty twenty one, I believe. <sighs> yeah, on. I know it's a little too long. I mean, my season one take is that is like they 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 kind of are like, oh man, like what the hell? Like Daniel, you know, he's he's kind of a dick. He's like that, you know, used car set. Well, he's not used car sales, but like you know that car yeah, salesman. He like, oh, like he's using the karate to like get there, like. Oh, you I'm a Johnny out. fan. I'm on team Johnny right now, but he's, he's messing up. But anyway, for those that haven't watched, I'm not going to ruin it, but oh. we'll see. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. All right. Well, I get, you know, look, I, I came into this interview today. I, I told you this offline of like, look, you, you're, people can hear your investing philosophy on a weekly basis on value after hours. You know, you've done a number of, of interviews talking about your investing thesis. So today I, that's why I'm kind of going all over the place and talking about whatever we feel like will come to mind because why yeah, not? We didn't intend on talking about Cobra Kai, but we did. We, didn't, we had no intention. I could literally, we could literally spend the next two hours talking about Cobra Kai. Yeah. I don't think that's and, what your, what your fan base is here for. Well, no, it's, you know, look, it's Plus, like a meta. Honestly, it's a I'm meta- not trying to, ru- I don't want to ruin it for anybody. No, of course so, like, not. like, if you listen to this, go watch that. Well, no, here's the thing. It's a meta commentary on Netflix. That's really what we're talking about here. That yeah, is kind right. of the, that's kind of the, the big, the big picture thing. It is but- a pretty good example of their distribution platform. I mean, like, y- you got to give them credit. That thing was on YouTube apparently for two years. I had no idea it existed. Now I'm like binging it. So there's, there's some merit there. Interestingly enough, I'm a YouTube fanatic i love youtube that's usually where like if i'm doing busy work i go to find random stuff to watch Hmm. and so i saw i saw it on youtube and i didn't want to pay for the youtube plus or whatever their Hmm. streaming services and so when it went to netflix i'm like yes finally it's on netflix i have the account boom i will binge the f out of this as fast as i possibly can so i I was just i didn't know that they were ever going to go to netflix but damn am i thankful they did because i was never i was never 
I was never going to buy the YouTube premium because I just no commercials. Like, okay, that's fine. Like I don't, I don't mind skipping through after, I mean, whatever. Yeah, I dig, man. I don't know all these. Uh, I feel like a lot of these big companies are just relying on like distribution moats and ecosystems and stuff. And I'm not really all that into uh, joining everybody's ecosystem. But um, yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that Cobra Kai came off Google's because I got to watch it. Yeah. The curate thing that I thought was really interesting was, you know, I, I guess I had underappreciated some of the structural reasons that people wouldn't um, buy stocks. Uh, you know, when I when I hear that, I think like sub a billion. Um, Curate's market cap at the time that they did their financial transaction was like 2.6 billion or so. And there were like some funds that, uh, you know, I had sort of published my work and I have a network of people that I talked to. So a couple of the analysts there had gotten some PMs on the phone with me. And like, I was just walking them through things. And it, it was surprising to me at that size, how many people said like, you know, we actually like the idea, but um, you know, we can't like, we wouldn't be able to commit enough money to buying this stock to really move the needle. And then if we wanted to get out, we want to be able to get out quickly and the volume is just not there to do it. And I, I guess I didn't really realize that that would occur in the name classic, of that size. Classic micro cap thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter for like, you know, me, right. I mean, there's plenty of volume for me to dump my shares, but I just, I guess, uh, it's gotten me really curious about where the cutoff is in size and like sort of, you know, thinking about um, as these companies grow, there's, there's a fundamental reason that they can be owned more, but there's also like, I mean, this is not news to any of your subs, but there's like a, almost like a vacuum that goes up, right. As both a function of the funds that are larger can buy them, but also like your liquidity premium goes down quite a, or, you know, compresses a little bit. Right. So that should make your valuation go up because as it gets more liquid, you know, it's easier to dump. So it's been, I I've had a very, regardless of the outcome. I mean, unless it's like catastrophic, that would really suck. But um, I met a lot of really good people by sharing that. Uh, so I'm happy. Look, not not to just keep throwing one liners at you, but I'm guessing you're a Lori fan on Shark Tank. You know that because that's, that's oh what yeah, I'm, that's right. That's, yeah. A, that's what I'm getting from this right now, dude. I'm into whoever can push <laughs> the products. I'm I'm a fan of. <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, how, how did this come across your screen, Curate? You know, had you been following it for a while before you ended up taking the stake, or you know, what was it that initially got you interested in it? Uh, I follow Malone um, and I've been going to those Liberty days for like three years and me and this dude, uh, Value Investor 03 on Twitter, uh, we always would joke like any time that I would think Curate was a good idea, I would send him, a, would like tag him in the tweet and then I'd send him a gif of like uh, Forrest Gump running as fast as he could. Um, but then they did this financial transaction. I just thought, um, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes you got to open up your mind again. So we'll see. It might be just smart enough to be dumb. That's for sure. You know, so you've been doing now the value after hours, I think how, for however long now. I think 53 I, I, episodes it's, or it's so. 53? Yeah, I man. mean, that's the rumor. What's, what's, the most, what's the most fun part about doing that? I mean, I, look, listen, I, I don't listen to every episode, but you know, I listen how to every dare one. You? I how know. dare how you? How dare you? I can't. Toby's going to kill me for even admitting that, you know, this I should, I should be. Up. it's kind of messed up. And you know mm. what? I feel, I feel woefully unprepared to even interview right now to even having admit that. I'm thinking of walking off, but I'm going to make an exception. <laughs> no, I'm all right. Uh, <laughs> don't, dude, don't I'll pull, tell you what's don't pull cool. a Gallagher on me. All right. Please no, don't pull a Gallagher on me. I'll tell you what's for me. The coolest thing about that is like, I met Toby and Jake at uh, Berkshire I don't know, like probably five years ago, maybe four years ago or something. And I don't think they'd mind me telling this. Like, I mean, we just got like drunk, you know, and uh, Jake less so than Toby and I. But uh, I mean, you know, we had like a great time and I, I've always really, really admired Deep Value. Um, like I, I've thought that that's one of the best books on investing, like almost ever written. Agreed. So um, a thousand percent agree. When I met him, I was kind of like, oh, you're fucking Toby Carlisle. Like, that's so dope. Uh, <laughs> and he's probably like, oh, great, another fanboy. Um, but then we hung out and like we were, I, he uh, had his business partner with him. And we, you know, I don't know. We just ended up like 
on a freaking roof in Omaha, just like drinking wine and talking about, you know, market philosophy and stuff. And, uh, it was a friendship that sort of, I never knew would lead anywhere. Right. Um, and I was just happy to meet those guys and find out that they're cool guys. And, uh, you know, then to be able to do this with them and to be able to help Toby to the extent that I am a part of helping him sort of, you know, get, uh, his not name out there per se, but sort of like help his brand in any way that I can. That's just been like a very cool thing to be able to reciprocate to somebody that I think has done a lot of good for the investing community. I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, I'm, I'm very thankful that you guys happen to run into each other in, <laughs> in Omaha and then spend all that time on the rooftop because otherwise we would not be graced with all this great content. And uh, look, I'll even admit, you know, part of my, I, I do an investors roundtable thing uh, every Thursday and part of it was inspired by, by what you guys got going on there. I didn't, I didn't necessarily want to bring like the same people every week, even though people will accuse me of that because I have like the same two or three that end up joining every week anyway. But you know, we're, we're, we were going for like a Bill Maher style. Like you never know who's going to show up or what yeah. topics we're going to talk about. You know, I wanted to do something similar, but like kind of a little bit of a twist and Hey, I give it up to value after hours and the success there for some of the inspiration. Cause that's, it's fun, man. You know, you get, you just talk about whatever, whatever fucking comes through. Pardon my French, whatever. No, comes it's true. Mind. And I think, I mean, like, I think with Toby's really unique insight into like that format, you know, I mean, each of us brings something to the table that's different. And like Jake and I see the world through a similar lens, but we also like hyper deviate in our portfolio strategy. So like I own Transdime and Charter and Curate now, like the leverage in my portfolio would make Jake, Jake puke and like, he'll tell it to me. Right. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, like I'll, I'll send Jake an idea that I'm like, dude, it really doesn't have that much leverage on it. And then he'll be like, yeah, but it's got leverage on it. And I'm like, yeah, but not much, you know? Uh, and so I think that Toby was, um, that he was, he was very good at figuring out what the three of us could bring to, uh, to show. And, you know, then it, it, it sort of took off, you know, we'll see how long we can do it and how big yeah. it can get, but it's been a, it's been a good experience. What would you say is the one topic that you got, that you discussed on there that's been the most talked about, or you've gotten the most feedback about thus far? I don't know, man. People love when I go at Buffett. <laughs> I mean, every <laughs> time that I do, people like it. Um, I, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to recall the stuff that we've talked about. Um, you know, I guess that, uh, I think that if I have one insight that maybe is unique to people, I, I think that people would be well served, uh, realizing that like there is the theoretical thing that do that we do. And then there's the actual thing we do. So the theoretical thing is like, you're trying to find a company that's undervalued and the value that you're <clears throat> putting on that company is, you know, the undiscounted free cash flow or whatever. But the real thing that we do is value minority interest in those companies. And a minority interest is worth a huge discount if you cannot trust management. And I think that that is like very, very, very overlooked in a lot of pitches. And a lot of pitches say, well, this thing, you know, could be worth this or it will be worth this. And I, I follow one company, Intrepid Potash. I've owned it in the past. I don't own it now. Um, I made a good amount of money on it when it was in distress. Um, and like at the end of the day, the problem with that entity is this guy controls it and he doesn't know how to tell the story. And he's investing. I, I mean, it's hard enough. It's a commodity business. They do have a low cost advantage in a geographic area. But like now he's got an oil services play where he's selling water. It's, it is actually a logical, like if I were him, I don't know that I would make a different decision. But the other side of it is like, you got to know how to tell the story to investors and eventually you got to return capital to investors. And there's a legitimate okay. argument to be made that this is just this guy's toy and he blows money everywhere. You know, and he's like, I mean, he bought it at one point. It was a $2 billion company. It's probably 200 million now. Like, he's destroyed a lot of value. So to value the minority interest in that, like you're his partner, right? So how comfortable are you that you're going to get your money back within any reasonable time frame? And right. 
I think it's really, really hard to say that you can be confident in that. Right. And maybe that's unfair, right? Maybe, maybe somebody has got a view from following it closer. That's like, no dude, you're wrong. And this is why, but I think if, if you're pitching something like that or investing in something like that, I think you have to be able to articulate why that statement's wrong. Yeah. And why the minority interest is going to be worth something. Right. No, we're going, I, the rabbit hole, I think we're going down. That's pretty interesting right here. And it's something that I face a lot on my show and with some of the shows that we put out there is this idea of talking about, you know, investing philosophy and your practical principles or lack thereof um, (laughs) when, when you're looking at potential investments and then like the, all right, well, what am I actually doing with my money right now? You know, and kind of, and kind of that balancing act of like, well, how much do I share? How much do I not share? You know, do we just keep it more, you know, just kind of informational in that sense? You know, like, how do you, how do you weigh that back and forth? Or do you just kind of like, you know, I'm going on the show and talk about whatever I want at this point. And, you know, you take it or leave it. I mean, look, I try to put out my thoughts. I mean, I, yeah. I try to say like, if, if I'm wrong, let me know. Now, I don't always react the best to being told that I'm wrong. I probably do some work on that. Um, you know, but I, I do, I, I guess that the only thing that I need to be better at is understanding that when you do things publicly and you have a little bit of a following that not everybody is going to have a thoughtful thought and many more than have a thoughtful thought are going to share their thoughts. <laughs> and that's not because they're actively trying to troll you. It's maybe just because they're either not thinking or they want to just say something. Um, and especially on Twitter, right? So like, there's just a lot of times that people will say something to me and I'm like, yeah, dude, like I fucking know. I mean, I've thought about this stuff <laughs> now, like curates tied to the TV bundle. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Uh, <laughs> like if I was pitching this and didn't think of that, I'd be a moron. Right. Uh, so I, I guess, and I'm, I'm not trying to, it, so t- sort of what I was saying about the minority interest, if the comment is they're tied to the, to the media bundle or the, or the t- cable bundle that gives them a customer acquisition advantage and people are underestimating the erosion of the bundle because of X, Y, and Z. Like that's a different comment, right? That's like a comment that we can actually start talking about right. just to say like, oh, well, they're tied to this. Yeah. I mean, I know. Right. Or, oh, banks are dying. Like I own Wells Fargo. I get it. You know, like I know what people think of banks. It trades at 70% a book. Like it's pretty clear people don't think it's a compounder. Right. Uh, So I guess that's, um, I don't know how I deviated. Maybe, maybe you triggered. No, no, no. You actually, no, you hit it. uh, No, you hit it on a good point. Like, look, you're, you're talking really about your newfound uh, media fame, you know, at this point. I don't know about fame. No, no, I'm I'm just giving you shit. But like, but you know, like the, the fact that, Hey, you know, now that you have more of a following, it's that thought process now of like, all right, well, if I'm going to say this, like, it's just being like really teaching yourself to take in like, all right, I know I'm going to get these trolls out here that are going to say the very obvious and, and, you know, at the same time, being thankful for the fact that, like, hey, I have this following. So there's going to be some really good analysts out there that might ask a good question that I can then yeah, maybe dude, like, think about. I'll tell you what, a little bit better. what terrifies me is the intelligence of our listening base. Like I legit am, I'm worried about le- like letting our listeners down when I talk to them because I've had people reach out to me and I'm like, holy shit, this person listens to what I'm saying. Like, that's crazy. You know, I mean. I've been able to talk to John Huber. Like I've admired John since uh, when I was like back starting at the bank, right? I was reading base hit investing and whatever the hell else he would put out. Like I was, I was reading Toby's blog. Like these are guys that I, I learned from. Right. So to be able to talk to them is crazy in my head. But then the other side of it's like, fuck, I got to say something that these guys appreciate listening to, Um, you know, because um, I, I, I'm trying to give back to the community, right? I mean, I've taken a lot from it, so I'm just trying to give something back. I I do a lot of work on the stuff that I say that I like. Like, I don't yeah. table pound when I just like sort of come across something, right? So, yeah. I guess what it's it has made me appreciate is that one, the work that I do is quality, right? And two, like a lot of the guys that you see on TV don't know that much more than you do. Um. And, you know, it was kind of one of the things that I love about Curate is 
I met these three guys on uh, on Twitter. They go by Ignore Narrative, at Mystery Capital, and uh, at Phoenix Value. And I've been talking to them because of this, right? And like, there's the part of me that really doesn't like uh, sharing an idea because of the blowback and the commitment bias and all that stuff. And then there's the other side that's like, I I think I just gained like three legit friends. And I also really look up to these guys and we push each other on ideas to make each other better. Like Science of Hitting Investing and Francisco Oliveira, yeah. those guys, I mean, if I'm talking about something, it's gone through them. Like they're basically my work pod. Um, <laughs> and and without them, I, I would be way dumber than I am. So it's been, uh, you know, it's been a double-edged sword. I think is at least for me is I left the bank. I was at a bank. I was underwriting commercial loans. Uh, so, so part of the reason that I'm on Twitter and so like public is I was, I am and was afraid, like if I blow up, I mean, I got to have some evidence that I'm, I've been working, right? Like, cause it's easy <laughs> to be like, what did you do? You just go retire and eat bonbons. Um, so that's what got me public. And then, uh, and then the network that, that being public has, brought into my life. I mean, my, my boy Rishi from uh, Google, like he had me out there and he walked me around there and like, that was awesome. And you know, the ability to, uh, I mean, I met Sarab Madan. Uh, yeah, he's amazing. He's dude, that guy, he's That's a amazing. gem. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, a lot of these guys that I really think are like really, really good people. You can find a lot of people playing wealth games in the world. If you're somewhat open with what you're doing. Uh, and as long as you don't get caught up in a status game, uh, the benefits can get immense. You know, at the end of the day, even if you're wrong on an idea, if you can show that you put in quality work and really put put out there your ideas in a way that seems like you, at the at least seems like you put in a lot of um, just effort and, and you're public with your ideas and you're public with your thesis, you know, I think that opens a lot of doors. You know, that's something for yeah. anybody listening that's thinking about getting into even just being a private retail investor, you know, that's one of the benefits of having a blog or screw it, starting your own podcast, just talking out your, your theses and your ideas. I mean that you, you'll be surprised how much, you know, uh, people are open to, to what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. And then you got to be ready. Like somebody might push you on a, on a detail that you don't know. And then you got to figure out like, is this, did I not do enough work? Right. Do I need to say, I don't know. Do I need to try to find the detail? Like that's, I mean, that's well, useful feedback. This is a good rabbit hole to go down because, you know, because you're, 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 you're public with, with your ideas and your, and, and what you, what you're putting out there. So you're getting in and I mean, I would assume you're getting probably inundated with, you know, uh, not just trolls, but also, uh, you know, good quality the trolls are very critiques. Mi- minority. Just I know. I'm just, I'm, except I'm, on banks. I'm no kidding. one likes banks, man. Oh. <laughs> but like, how, how do you, how do you, you've been doing this for a while. So how do you kind of filter out the, the noise from like, Ooh, that's, that's a legitimate thing I should be looking at. You know, when it's know, from, you know. You know. like Masa Sun Capital pinged me yesterday. Cause I was talking about cable. And, you know, he said, like, how, how expensive is it to, to hang uh, fiber lines, right? And, like, I don't have the exact answer. My best guess, based on the research that I've done, is it's roughly 10% more expensive to, ha- to hang, like, one of these optical networks than it is the traditional cable network. And you save somewhere between 1% and 3% of maintenance capex. So, like, that's the best answer I got. And he wasn't trying to troll me. And I felt like he was somebody that if I throw that answer out there and it's wrong, he's going to correct me. And at that point, it's just like, you just got to either figure out if you are too embarrassed to be wrong on something that is somewhat critical to a thesis. Like I hold cable in size. So if I'm wrong on that, it can look really stupid. On the other hand, I don't think that's the make or break issue that like, that's not the most important question, but I do think it's an important question. Right. I think answers like that, at least for me, are what give me the conviction to hold when the market says you're wrong. Right. right. Because it's like, I, you guys are wrong. Right. But right. I think you need to know, because in my opinion, if you start to get feedback from share price, uh, that becomes a very dangerous game. I couldn't agree more. All right. So I'm getting back to my, you know, I'm going to be titling this episode, Shooting the Shit with Bill Brewster, by the way. That is, that works. I think, I think that'll be good because it took up until 45 minutes to get to 
only two of my structured questions and okay. it, and, and it works Cobra because Kai was not in the in the interview process so that was Cobra, not... you know what i had it as a footnote of like okay. you know, I, I heard rumblings Fair. i heard a deep rumor that you, you should were really consider into Cobra Kai. Yeah, you should consider upgrading that in your uh take it out I of mean, footnotes put it in the head notes but look we haven't even gotten into baseball yet i heard you talk about that on on, Bra- on brandon's show and I, I i'm a huge baseball fan so i, I of course wanted to bring cubs up, but we'll see although cubs? i got some friends that are in the braves but i don't care about your finances <laughs> look i'm a yankees fan and uh this is oh uh, my grandma loves the yankees oh, she watches good. every game oh nice oh, that's no awesome. nice well you can tell we can both commiserate together on what's hopefully is not a sweep of the Indians. But if that happened, if that happens, I would not be surprised, you know, considering who, you know, I, I we're just waiting for when Stanton's going to have, you know, pull a calf from like, you know, yeah, that would be bad. Ugh, these freaking guys. But anyways, we'll go on baseball at the next talk. But my favorite question to ask everybody that I have on here, you know, what would you say is an investor experience that impacted you the most in your career? I followed Carl Icahn into Hertz and that was so fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> just blindly and, uh no no i i fully committed myself to the hertz thesis based <laughs> on his intelligence and that was really really dumb yeah i did the work i looked for confirmatory evidence that he was correct rather than just listening to myself uh i was somewhat smart enough after going to omaha for the weekend i went to omaha and then i went to denver and um i so this is probably like four or five years ago. Uh, and I didn't need to rent a car. And if you don't need to rent a car in Denver, like you legit don't need rental cars anywhere. And, and that was so when I, I just had to look at myself and I was like, are you serious? Like you're really going to be long Hertz based on some stupid airport real estate thesis when Uber is just destroying them. Um, so I was smart enough to sell after that, but that, that was really dumb and quite formative. Yeah. I would also say that, I never got involved, but watching uh, Bruce Berkowitz and Eddie Lampert torpedo steers, that was pretty interesting for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. And to watch Bruce Berkowitz not be willing to get off that uh, horse and like for him to consistently say like, no, it's time horizon. I mean, Bruce, I'm sorry if you're listening, but uh, I'd say it to your face. Like that was a huge mistake. And, And from a guy who... I think from what I've heard, like really does the work. Um, And I think he was doing the work to prove that he was right rather than trying to figure out why he was wrong. When the reason he was wrong was like right in front of his face. Yeah. So another quick question on this investor experience. What was, what was that first experience that got you hooked in investing? You know, I bought Qualcomm at like seven fifty, and then it got destroyed in 2000. That was that that got you hooked. Yeah, I kind of like that. I mean, I didn't like like getting destroyed, but um, I was kind of it. It made me really think about like what is this market, right? Mm -hmm. And like, how does it get so hyped, and how does it get so destroyed, and sort of like mass psychology. I started to get pretty interested in that. Then I went to college and sort of wasn't as I. My problem in college was I started to study finance and like. I don't know. We started to go over efficient markets hypothesis and I'm like right after getting destroyed in Qualcomm. So I was like, this is all bullshit. And then, you know, we're like doing uh valuations and I mean, you know how the formula works. The, the denominator can make everything swing so much. And the teacher was teaching like so much precision. And I was like, I just, this is bogus. Um, and it kind of, uh, I, I probably should have uh, just pushed myself to get, you know, a real financial internship and, uh, really try to learn. Instead, I sort of, I went to Franklin Templeton for a part of a summer and then I got a bartending gig and I was making just like a ton of cash and bartending in New York. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to do my internship. So that was a mistake, but, um, nevertheless, like you go to me sc- here, where'd you go to school again? Auburn university. Oh, nice. Wait, so yeah. I, so just during the summers, you went to New York and, and, and worked there? Yeah, that one summer, that one summer, yeah. So I, I had had this financial internship, and I had a stepbrother. He owned like uh, six bars in New York or was part owner in them. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You start getting fast cash. and Look, dude. The other, the other things that come along with bartending in New York, it's, it was tough to say no to. That's very tough to say. Hey, jobs like that when you're just in college or just out of college are very hard. I was a surf instructor for four years in yeah. undergrad, so I, I get it. 
<laughs> Meanwhile, at that internship, this dude comes in <laughs> to pitch uh, XM. It was either XM or Sirius because they hadn't, they hadn't uh, merged yet. And my buddy had gotten the first iPod that had the, the, like the dial that still rotated. Yep. And I asked the guy, I was like, why would I want radio when I have eight days of music with me in my pocket right now? Right. Cause like I saw his and I got one and I didn't buy Apple. And like, that was so mm-hmm. stupid. I feel the same. I way mean, at that it. valuation at that time, you didn't need much more of a thesis than like, these are new computers that have colors and the iPods dope. Like that's really all you needed. If, as soon as they started to make some cash and you had that thought, like you could have. What, just... what year was that? I had to be like 2003. It was like 2003. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that, you know, has cost me a lot and it's not Buffett's fault. It's my fault for my interpretation of him. Yeah. But like, I never should have listened to him on that. Stay away from tech. You know, that was stupid, but that's not his stupidity. That's mine. Yeah. And cause what time period was that when he said, or is that just his general? He said it forever. But I mean, the issue uh, with like my stupidity on, on his interpreting his statement is like those guys are, are preaching a method of thinking. Right. And like what they're really preaching is to figure out what you're good at and think independently how you think and then swing in your spots. And when he's saying, you know, stay away from tech or whatever, I don't think he was ever saying like you stay away from tech, but that's what I heard. Right. And it's really Mm -hmm. him saying like, I need to stay away from tech. (laughs) And you know, it's like, um, what do they say? Too, uh, too, too late. Too smart. Too soon oh. old, something like that. So I was, I was, you know, ten years too, uh, too late to become intelligent. Assuming I am now. I couldn't echo those the, that that thought process more. <laughs> but so we we touched on this at the beginning, and I wanted to kind of get. I, I think this is a great way to close out this interview. You know, for for those new investors out there, you know, what advice do you have for them that are looking at the stock market as a place to build wealth? I mean, I think you got to understand that you're buying a minority interest in a business. I think that's where it starts. Okay. Then second, like read Market Wizards by Schwager. Read, uh, you know, Poor Charlie's Almanac. Read, uh, you know, I'm I'm not trying to just go through a book list here, but like Influence by Robert Cialdini. Um, Study like Bill Miller. That dude is so creative. Uh, And, you know, study why he blew up read Hampton's blog. Like there's, there's so much out there and I would just really encourage you if you're like really into the, um, the craft of investing for lack of a a better term, study a lot of different people and then figure out your, like who you are and how to adopt some of this stuff. Some of these guys on Twitter that I honestly think are Momo traders, uh, uh, you know, and I, I only get a little bit upset when I think that they're disguised as fundamental investors. I don't even think Momo trading is a bad strategy. Like, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And if that's who you want to be, then be it, you know, but I, I just don't, don't try to be somebody else because I think investing is a very personal game. And if you choose to go active, you're going to need to figure out what game you're playing and why it's right for you. Otherwise, you know, go passive and go do something else with your life. Cause there's a lot of better pursuits out there than investments, but it's also given me, it's opened my life to possibilities and curiosities that I never thought that I'd have. So it's something that I love very much. That's a great way to end it. So Bill, before we get more information where everybody can find uh, everything that you put out there and listen to value after hours real quick, are you, uh, we mentioned a lot of names on here. Um, I, I think you, mo- for the most part, disclosed whether you're currently a shareholder in a good amount of them. But um, just, I guess, let's get a final wrap up. Like, uh, are you shareholder in any of the names that we can think of? I'm that- sure I am. I'm sure I'm a shareholder. Well, I'm definitely a shareholder in Berkshire. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to think. I you're if I said Netflix, about cable. Yeah. If so I said anything about cable, I'm long. Curate, I'm long. Uh, Transdime, I'm long. Yeah. I mean, I think I said, like, I have a lot of leverage in the portfolio and then I yeah. rattled off the name. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that, that would be, that would be it. If you want to ask me a question about them, I'm probably not going to answer you. Don't take it personally. I'm not trying to hammer in my thoughts. 
<laughs> Very good. Well, Bill, with that, where can my audience go and follow you on social media, find your website, and then also listen to Value After Hours every week? Uh, I write on my blog at solomarcapital.group. I probably need to change that to solomarcapitalgroup.com, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, at Bill Brewster SCG on the Twitter machine and uh, Value After Hours within uh, Tobias Carlyle's uh, The Acquirer's Podcast uh, sort of feed. We're a, we're a sub sub podcast within what he normally does. So there we go. Well, Bill, the third leg of the triumvirate, the most important leg of the triumvirate. Right. It it's falls without this guy. It falls. That's right. Holler at you, boy. That's right. <laughs> Bill, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm sure we'll chat again at some point in the future. And I look uh, forward I really, to it. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, man. Take care of yourself. Enjoy that view. Yeah, right. We'll do. See you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast.